Uh, sorry, guys, for running just a bit late here. We're just getting reports now that Russia's air defenses have destroyed targets heading towards the Khamim uh, air base in Syria. Uh, not sure yet exactly what it is. Says the Russian S-400 surface air missile system at Khamim air base in Syria uh, the, have, re, have intercepted, destroyed several aerial targets heading towards the country's Khamim air base in Syria late on Tuesday, a military spokesman said. After the fall of dark, the means of airspace uh, control at the Russian Khamim base uh, detected small sized aerial targets unknown of origin and distance from the airfield. The airbase spokesman said all the targets were destroyed by the anti aircraft uh, anti aircraft fire means of the Russian airbase. So I'm, I'm assuming not the S 400 system that did that, but uh, more than likely just uh, big guns, kind of like they did over in Riyadh, right? Hmm. Very, very troubling. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, that's just just happened to see that right before coming on here. I was kind of just double back uh, looking looking at what's breaking right now in Syria, and uh, uh, to see if there's any other issues that might be coming out before coming on here. Uh, so, at, at any rate, as uh, Russia says, U.S. has no intention to leave Syria. They always are saying that. Uh, that's kind of like old news there, right? All right, let's get right into some things that are happening, though. Uh, Kadyrov ready to deploy additional Chechen forces to Syria on Putin's orders. You know, this is really gearing up to turn into a major, major war in the very near future if something doesn't change. And I'm talking about uh, change immediately. It's just that big of an issue here. Uh, we're, we're seeing right now that Russia is definitely deploying the S-300 system. Haaretz is reporting it as well as uh, uh, Brett Barton News. They're both reporting, reporting this situation right now. And of course, Russia has already said, not, not President Putin, not uh, Sergei Lavrov, but another official has stated that if these missiles are targeted, there will be catastrophic consequences. Uh, and now, of course, Israel is the one that there's concerned about targeting the S-300 system. Uh, now, according to Lieberman, uh, the uh, Eva, uh, Eva Gador Lieberman said Tuesday that Israel may strike the Russian S-300 anti-aircraft defense system in Syria if they are used against Israel. So that's a step back from what another... Um, uh, another former uh, uh, military advisor had said in Israel where they said they would have to take these systems out. Now, uh, Mr. Lieberman is saying if they target Israeli planes, they will indeed target the S-300 system. That's definitely going to drag the United States back into the conflict if that were to happen. And, and quite frankly, there's only one thing that I'm still troubled about. You know. I understand when Israel believes they have a right to defend themselves. And no doubt there are a lot of threats for Israel. But we cannot, as an Israeli people, you cannot expect that if you go into a sovereign nation and just target the Syrian, uh, Syrian forces there inside, the, inside of Syria because the jihadists over there that you're helping are lobbing a, a you know a, a, a mortar round back into Israeli territory so that you will attack Assad. You know whatever happened to the, you know Israel being a true humanitarian? Whatever happened to the the nation of Israel where we would say you know Syria is you know more of a secular nation? They're more like Israel. They've protected the Jews. They've protected the Christians. You know, they have freedom of religion in their country. They don't necessarily have freedom of the press, but they have pretty much freedom of religion in their country. Whatever happened to Israel saying, wait a minute, we need to protect Assad. I mean, because the guys that are there that are fighting against them, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and all of this bunch here, these are true extremists. Behead children, ISIS militants. But no, our leaders are supporting them. I mean, I mean, this is like, 
nuts. You know, this is one reason why God, we, we've started Patreon and I'm, I'm really getting ready to get really geared up and going there. And I'm going to have to, you know, Rick Wiles just got banned permanently from YouTube from what we understand there. He came out, did a message today. He's been banned. He got the three strikes only because they searched his old archive videos. And it won't take long for him to ban us as well then. Make sure you're on live stream as early as live. For those of you that, uh, you know, let's say if you don't want to do Patreon, go to live stream, get signed up in there. Because I'm telling you, the days are numbered. We are on Patreon as well. We're looking for an alternative uh, way of loading the videos on there. We, you can do it with YouTube, but we're using a, a totally different account than what Israeli News Live is here. Uh, and they are not public videos there because we, it, it keeps us from getting you know whacked by YouTube. Uh, at least I think that's the way that works. Not sure. Uh, and, and definitely thumbs up the video. I guess the more thumbs up we get, the, the, the less likely we're going to get uh, slammed down by uh, this fascist uh, regime of Google that is running everything. Very, very terrible what happened to Rick there uh, because of uh, his stance there. And I and understand one of his issues that they hit him on was the Armenian genocide. Uh, well, you know, why don't they go ahead and ban, ban the Vatican? I'm not for the Vatican at all, but, you know, the Pope said it too. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh, this is insane. All right, back to the situation, the S-300 system, though. We also have uh, Russia ramps up arms. I want to thank Billy Night Train for sending this to me here from Debka file. Syria to warns Israel of catastrophic price for interfering to show the picture here. Of course, it's only got like maybe two containers on the entire ship. So I guess not a huge uh, shipment of arms going in there. But it says Russia has doubled the number of arms ships heading for Syria. Tatarus from the Black Sea through the Bosphorus. Depco files military sources report the acceleration of Russian arms traffic to Syria. Um, has been noted in the last fortnight, uh, fortnight, the vessels are loaded with containers holding military hardware. It is believed that they contain quantities of advanced S-300 air defense missiles bound for Bashar al-Assad's army and short-range uh, Panzer S-1 systems capable of intercepting UAV and cruise missiles. You know, I mean, think about it, guys. I mean, listen, when do, I mean, does, does, does President Assad not have a right to defend himself? You know, because look, I, I, I look at what's what's honest and true and right. I don't I don't care about the nonsense uh, of let's go kill everybody in Syria, which we're going to get into that tonight. I, I, I'm going to share some things with you I haven't shared with you before. But why doesn't this man have a right to defend himself and defend his people? You know, he's defending not only the Christians in Syria but also the Yazdis who, by the way, uh, have certainly been massacred by some of the groups that the U.S. supports in Syria. Yeah. And, so, and the Turks as well. They have murdered the Yazdis. And the Yazdis, by the way, are descendants of the wise men. The only one that has been a defender of these people has been the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. And in 2011, he was, willing to, he was willing to give up the Golan to make peace with Israel, to give up his bid for the Golan, to try to get it back. Now, I realize, as a Jewish-believing person, I do believe that we're, we're living in a, in a time, and we know that from a biblical standpoint, going back into the ancient history and everything, the Golan actually belonged to the Jewish people 2,000 years ago. All right. So, but again, the president, Syrian president, he's willing to give it up just to try to get peace with Israel. Now, there's always been tit for tat. Even in the his, history of Israel and Syria, there's always been fighting in, in you know, just b between the two of them, fighting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, but again, I always like to go back to the fact that our mothers were Syrian. All right. Now, I've got to share with you guys some stuff here that I think is very troubling. Uh, by the way, before I go into this, Germany's Merkel 
she's not on the bandwagon with uh, Trump uh, at all and things. She's not willing to do the embassy to Jerusalem. And she's also uh, says yes to the Iran nuclear deal. She wants to keep it like it is. Um, you know, I don't know what to say when it comes to this Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I, to me, no matter what you're dealing with, eventually nations are going to get these nuclear weapons. It's just all there is to it. And, and, and then again, how can we call the, how can the pot call kettle black uh, when U.S., Russia, Israel, all of them, Israel has, I think, what, 80 nuclear bombs? The U.S. has how many hundreds of them and Russia the same? You know, I realize they're trying to prevent other nations from getting them so we don't have more and more nuclear weapons. But when it comes down to the end of the day, guys, listen, the only guy that's ever been dirty enough to use a nuclear weapon was the United States. And they used it on Japan, a nation that had already been defeated. Now, I, I agree. It wasn't the U.S. that attacked Japan. It was Japan that attacked the U.S. So that's a big difference, and I realize that. But after Pearl Harbor, and I had a grandfather driving down the street with the bullets going through the top of his car as well. So, you know, uh, I understand the feeling for those that were there at Pearl Harbor that day. But nonetheless, we did defeat the Japanese long before these nuclear bombs were ever dropped. You know, this really came down to just an experiment. Let's see how it works. You know. It's really terrible. Anyway, I, I want to share something with you. So this really kind of comes to my mind. I was doing a little research today about Syria, about Damascus. And of course, I remember about Elisha. Uh, and Elisha actually kind of had a heart for the king of Syria. Uh, and he was sent to pray for the king of Syria. And when he prayed for him, uh, he went and inquired before the Lord. The Lord said he would. Uh, he would recover of the illness that he had, but he still would not leave his bed because God knew that he was going to be killed by Hazael. And Hazael, of course, was also anointed by Elijah to be the next king of Syria because God knew that Hazael would bring judgment on Israel because of Israel's sins. That being said, I want to share some thoughts here with you. Now, this is from uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. This is really interesting to me because you have to keep in mind, this is also right about the time that the seven-year famine, or, or right after the seven-year famine had begun during the time of Elijah. So it kind of makes me wonder if we are not coming up to that final uh, tribulation period. Uh, and you know, I may differ a little with some people on how that works out as far as scriptural on that. Uh, you know, so let me just state that to, 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 uh, uh, to, so you guys are aware of this. But when Elisha, there was a man named Nahum, Na Naaman, and Naaman, of course, as we know, was a Syrian soldier. And Naaman had leprosy. Uh, and as, as, as we know this story, there, there is, is told Naaman because there was a girl that had been captured from Israel that was, that was living in that country there. And she had said that there was a prophet of God in, in Israel and that Naaman could actually be healed of his leprosy if, if he just inquired of the Lord. So, so anyway, at that point there, Naaman goes to Elisha, and uh, Elisha, of course, you know, he, he uh, comes out, he tells Naaman what he needs to do to be healed. He'll have to dip seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman, being very boisterous, refuses, to, uh, doesn't want to do it, but instead he says, I have the clean rivers of Syria. What do I need to come to the dirty river of Jordan and, and, and dip in it? Now, keep in mind, there's something I really want you to think about here. Naaman, with his leprosy, is a type of the Syrian military today. And my Syrian friends, don't misunderstand me what I'm going to say here. I want you to listen closely. Naaman had, had the leprosy. 
In other words, the Syrian army has been has taken such a beating from these seven years of war that they're severely wounded, severely sick, so to speak. And I realize that the Syrian army has also been winning with the help of Russia. All right. But watch what happens. Naaman was wroth, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and recover the leper. Amana and uh, far, uh, far part, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, Wash to be clean? Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. All right, now this is not the point I want to get at. Elijah the prophet cared about Naaman, the military officer for the Syrian army. He actually had compassion upon him. All right? And even though the man was arrogant, he still had a little bit of He had compassion on him. Now what's interesting in the case of Naaman he goes away. He's, he's first, he wants to try to give Elisha a reward for what he did. But Elisha will not take anything of his hand. He did it from the goodness of his heart. But Gehaza, the servant of Elisha, ends up, after Elisha sends him away, Gehaza follows after him. And lies to Nahum, lies to him in order to get the blessing. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master had spared this Naaman, Naaman the Armenian, Armenian or Syrian, in not receiving at his hand that which he brought, as the Lord liveth, I will surely run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw one running after him, he alighted from the, the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well, my master, hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there are come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray, thee a talent of silver and two changes of raiment. And Naaman said, Be content to take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver into a bag so, and two changes of raiment and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bore them before him. All right? Now, it wasn't that this got past Elisha either. And Elisha was not happy with Gehazi for what he did. And instead, Gehazi ended up with leprosy. What's the moral behind this when I say this? What, 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 what is that moral of the story? The moral of this story here is the fact that today Gehazi represents a minister of the gospel of Elisha. And Gehazi willing to lie against the Syrian in order to get gain. And this is exactly what I see happening today. I'm seeing this in the world today. Ministers, because they get a meal ticket out of it, are willing to go against the Syrian army and lie because they get a little bit more silver and a change of clothes. Instead of being true and honest, you know, uh, you have to understand, Elisha is a prophet of Israel. Syria and Israel had been at war for quite some time already. But Elisha, as a, not just a prophet of Israel, but a prophet of God and a servant of God, looks upon 
Naaman with compassion the same way that Christ would do. In the same way Christ did do. And even though Na Na Naaman was arrogant, and no doubt the Syrian military is arrogant when it comes to Israel, nonetheless, he did heed the instruction when it comes to a true man of God. And as a result, was healed of his leprosy. But Gehazi, like these ministers and, and, and television journalists that are out there condemning Syria falsely all for the money, they'll get their reward. I want to give you another example here. Really interesting. You go to the very next chapter, chapter 6. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And we got on the screen Aram, but it's still Syria. Aram is Syria. And he took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Armenians or the Syrians are coming down. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and they guarded himself there, and not once nor twice. And the heart of the king, of Syria was sore troubled for, for this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, "Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel?" He thought there was a spy amongst them. And one of his servants said, "Nay, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber." Wouldn't that be a nice new thing to be happening in Israel today? But you know what? The Israeli politicians have sold out to the Vatican and what their desire is. That's what I got to be careful about. They'll give me a strike for saying something like that, and then I'll get three and I'll be out. I'm, I've already, I'm sure I got plenty of them sitting there waiting for them anyway. And one of the servants said, Nay, my Lord, O King, but Elisha the prophet, okay, he telleth thee what's in his bedchamber. And he said, Go and see where is. Where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. So the king sends his military, and they surrounded Elisha. Elisha comes out and prays that God smites the, the military blind. And then he takes them and he leads them right into the army of Israel. Now, what's interesting is the king of Israel comes out and he says, uh, when they came into Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Now Elisha tricked them. They come to capture Elisha to take them back to the king because he was telling all the secrets that's going on in their military plans. All right. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, what, what did Elisha answer? I hope you guys can see this. You know what? Let's look back here on the board. Then. And then he answered, Shalt thou not, thou shalt not smite them. Hast thou taken captive with sword and with thy bow those whom thou wouldest smite? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared a great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master. And the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Isn't that the proverb, or not the proverb, but the commandment of the Lord? Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And instead, our leaders are over there in the middle of the Syrian country supporting terrorists that behead children. Just in closing, let me share one more with you guys. I mean, this is just troubling to me. It, it really is. If we go to, back to Micah, and you go to chapter four. And this 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 is a very good place too for um,
for those that had the idea that the Jews that are there in Israel today are not uh, true Jews. For let all the people walk, each one of them, uh, in the name of its God, but we walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. All right? Halteth. That's the old English that they use there. Wounded and lame. The only way that could have been fulfilled was after the Holocaust itself in Europe. That is when God was bringing back those that had been driven away and her that I have afflicted. We can't say that about the days of slavery in the United States as being a fulfillment of that prophecy because the slavery had been too many years past. But in the case of the Holocaust, the Jews came immediately out of the Holocaust and they were coming back and they were halt, they were lame, they were withered up, they were, they were, they had been, they had just come out of affliction. All right, that is what the scripture is being fulfilled as. You cannot apply it. Though I have a compassion for the, the black people and what they have suffered in this life, you know, it doesn't match the word of God. All right, now, and I will make her that is halted a remnant and her that was cast far off a mighty nation. The Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from thenceforth even forever. All right, so she's there. And thou migdal eder, migdal eder is, is, uh, is a Hebrew expression, which is like the leaders. The heel of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, yea, the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. All right. So these leaders are going to be able to, they get to reign over Jerusalem. But then what does he say to them? Now, why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy Counselor perish that pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city and shalt dwell in the field and shall come even unto Babylon, and there shalt thou be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemy. Why? Why do they go to Babylon? Because the Vatican is exactly what they have used to get their power. Now, for my black brothers and sisters that believe that you got fake Jews in Israel, well, there's your fake Jews right there. It's these leaders, many of them Jesuits. You know, when Menachem Begin got into power and became prime minister, that toppled the movement that the Vatican had been working with from the very beginning when Moshe Sharit and Ben-Gurion were the first two prime ministers of Israel. Menachem Begin was our first true real prime minister of Israel. But they wasted no time sending in Mike Evans as a Jesuit to weaken his ministry. And of course, to anoint Netanyahu which I didn't know that at the time, but now I know that Jesuit plan. I'll save that for Patreon to go deeper into this. We really need to get over there and lay down some things, guys. Uh, I appreciate you guys so much, and, and, and uh, I'm glad you joined us here tonight. Uh, if you do uh, want to, to, to be a part of this ministry to help us to keep this going, we appreciate it. You can visit our website, israelinewslive.org. Uh, and we do thank you for your time. And, and definitely get with us there either on Patreon or live stream, Israeli News Live live stream. Uh, we're, we're, we're gonna, we gotta get the live stream back up and running, but we have been hacked with our internet again. Uh, Wendy, God bless you, sister. You're welcome. And Brian, and so many of you, I appreciate you guys tremendously. Uh, but um, again, Patreon, we will be saying things that I don't normally say because of the concern of uh, just how they might shut you down. 
but live stream, I can't encourage you enough. We, we, we're trying to get someone out to fix the, the internet uh, uh, stream here. They've done something to us once again, um, and we need to get that fixed there so we can get, get you guys up to speed on what's going on. Uh, anyway, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to do a thumbs up on this video here. Uh, let's, let's drive them nuts with uh, good feedback there. Uh, you know, we've always got about, oh, about a dozen or so that just love to do thumbs down. But, you know, that's all right. You talk about the Lord Jesus and they don't like that. Ooh, isn't that terrible? I mean, I, how, you know, that's what's funny. Do you know that the people that normally thumbs down this video are supposed to be Christians? Well, I tell you what, if you came to the house, I would do just like the prophet said. I would feed you and treat you well. That maybe somehow or another would be a blessing to you as well. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom and Erev Tov.